19th. Go ahead, make sure that you sign up at the connections table for that. They need lots of help uh, to, to make the car show run, uh, especially the, the Friday before. Um, there's a setup time, setting up tents and, and uh, the great room and, and things like that need to be set up. And then there's the Monday after they also tear down. So if you can't be there on the day of the event or can't help on the day of the event, there's just lots of ways that you can serve and help the car show. Um, it's a great way to bring people from the community uh, into our, our church, and we can invite them into our family and, and, and show them who Jesus is if, if they've never met him before. So it's a, it's a great, great event. And then the last one is Forward to Freedom. And that starts this week. You can sign up at the Connections table. So check out this video that has to do with Forward to Freedom. And kids, you'll be dismissed after this video. Good morning. I'm Jen Gerber. And I am really excited about this next session of Forward to Freedom coming up soon. This is a session that I just feel passionate about. I feel renewed in vision. I believe that God really wants to do great things in those that attend this class. If this is a time in your life when you're just saying, God, I just want to get with you. I just want to deal with some of these things that I've struggled with. I just want to spend time focused on you. This might be the time for you to attend Forward to Freedom. I'd like to invite you to join me and my team on Tuesday, this Tuesday, July 2nd at 6.30. We're going to be in the great room, and it's just going to be a really good time of being real with God, of um, learning, of getting some tools that can help us to walk in more freedom. I would love to see you there. Good morning, kids. You guys can head off to your classes. Parents, if you're not quite sure where to take them, there are check-in stations right over there in the Kids Connection area. Somebody will be there to help you uh, get your kids settled in. Also want to say hi to those who are joining us online. Glad to have you with us this morning. I've, I've been told that the Uganda team is also trying to watch online. Let's give a, just a really big warm yell for the Uganda team. We'll see if they can pick us up on the microphone here. Hey, we miss you guys. We're thinking of you. All right, and if it sounded like I was yelling at the computer, sorry about that. All right, also just want to let you know that the Mwendo Choir and the Gerbers, and I think some other people are helping them, they are in cold water this morning, uh, I think at the First Baptist Church there. So be praying for them. They've been busy all weekend, and it's a good thing. That's why they came, right? They didn't come to be bored. They came to be busy. So we're excited that God is opening doors for them. Psalm 145 says, The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are about." all who are bowed down. Uh, this morning I'm going to continue part three of our series, Honest with God. It's a three-week look into the Psalms. We're not necessarily trying to teach the entire book of Psalms. That would take far too long. There's 150 chapters. Um, but the Psalms are poems that were written uh, to be sung. They're not, uh, uh, it's not meant to be treated as doctrine or teaching, but they're, they're poets expressing their hearts and uh, in some cases, they're prayers. In other cases, they're praises. Sometimes they're in desperation. And sometimes they're uh, just joyful and full of life and hope. Uh, but I love the Psalms. They're very relatable for us. And this morning, I believe that we can uh, look at a Psalm and find, find ways that we can relate uh, to the author of this Psalm. Well, in the cave in the wilderness sat the future king of Israel. He was the youngest of his family. He grew up as the, the shepherd boy of the family, watching the sheep. And it was while he was alone with the sheep that he perfected his skills on the harp and with the sling. His name was David. Although this time, as we find him in the Psalms, we see that David is once again alone. See, David was anointed to be the king of Israel by the prophet Samuel. Samuel showed up at his house uh, with oil to, an, to anoint the next king to su succeed, Saul. And when, uh, God, when he, all the brothers passed before him, Samuel said, surely there's one more because none of these are the ones I'm supposed to anoint. And they sent for the shepherd boy out in the field and they brought David in and God spoke to him and said, that's the one. And he was anointed with oil. This David has slain his giant. He's had success on military campaigns. 
He's a popular guy in Israel, but yet it's his popularity that has led to arousing the king's jealous anger and rage. Twice now, Saul, the king, David's father-in-law at this point, twice now, Saul has tried to kill him with a spear, pinning him to the wall. Both times, David eluded him. Finally, Saul sent a dispatch of soldiers to David's house by night to take him while he lay in his bed. Fortunately, David got word through his friend Jonathan, and he escaped. He escaped to the cave in the wilderness, where we find him right now in Psalm 142. And here we can see the passionate whisper of his prayer from his hiding place. Psalm 142. If I can find it. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who know my way. In the path where I walk, men have hidden a snare for me. Look to my right and see. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, O Lord. I say you are my refuge. My portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry. For I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. As I read through the Psalms this week and looked at different things that we could talk about, I was drawn to the little phrase that showed up underneath the headings of the Psalms. And I was drawn to this one because it's not just words on a paper. There's a story behind it. And I believe we can relate with that story. See, there it is. A mascal of David when he was in the cave. A prayer. And here we find a man in a cave with hopes, with dreams, with the promise, with anointing. The world was before him. Man, when he slayed that giant Goliath, it seemed that everything was just going to open up before him. And yet as fast as he rose to fame and popularity, he was driven to the cave, fleeing for his life. And it's there in that cave that we hear the passionate prayer of a man going through the hard things in life. I can relate with that. And I think you can this morning, too. I believe that we all have cave-like experiences in our lives. I, I don't imagine any of you have ever actually spent the night in a cave or months, but we have had experiences that remind us of the cave, experiences where we're alone, experiences where we feel desperate, experiences where we feel betrayed or misunderstood Experiences where we feel like the world's against us, even though our hearts are full of promise and good intentions. We've had our cave-like experiences, and I believe that caves are where God takes men and women and transforms them into kings and queens. David had to go through the cave before he went to the throne. That was God's process for him. And I believe it was through that cave experience that God worked in David's life. I don't know everything that God did in David's heart as he went through the cave, but very few kings finished well as we read through the annals of the stories of the kings of Israel. Very few finished well. And while David made his share of mistakes along the way, he finished well. And David is recorded as being a man after God's own heart. Where did he develop that heart when he was alone? In the field with the sheep, in the cave, fleeing for his life. I believe the cave is where God does his deepest and most intimate work in our lives. And we all have our own cave experiences 
to go through. See, the cave is our place of becoming. It's the place where we become that version that God has created us to be. The cave can be a beautiful place, even though it's a lonely place. <clears throat> so important in our development are caves that James, the brother of Jesus, says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, caves are so important and crucial in our lives that James said, we need to be thankful for those things. We need to consider them a joy, a joy that we would go through those experiences. Why? Because God is working. God is working in those cave experiences if we'll let him, if we'll look to him, if we'll trust and rely on him. God is at work in the cave. And so we can consider it pure joy because he's taking us to a place where we become mature and complete. See, nobody sets out with the goal in life to be immature, to not complete the race that is marked out for them. But we fail to get there because we don't push through and persevere. And we don't embrace our time in the cave. We see this image, uh, it's a statue actually, of David. It was chiseled out by the artist Michelangelo. We did a headshot because uh, we wanted to keep it PG uh, here. <laughs> it took Michelangelo three years to chisel that beautiful statue. It's, one, it's considered to be one of the masterpieces of the Renaissance uh, when it comes to sculpting. It's chiseled out of marble. It took him three years to chisel that statue. It's in Florence. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. Um, but we, we love the image of the perfected statue but we hate the thought of the chiseling and of the process. But God has a chiseling and he has a process for us because he has a place of perfection and maturity that he has for you to get. We all get cave time. For some of us, it's months. Sometimes it's only hours. Sometimes it's days. Maybe you feel like you've been in a cave for years. The time varies for all of us. Sometimes we're in the cave and we're out and then we're back in. And chances are, if you're not in the cave right now, you recently came out of one or there's one in your future. Not trying to prophesy there. <laughs> but we have a way of finding ourselves in the caves of life. So what do we do? How do we respond from the cave? And I believe we can find five things here in this psalm in 142. How to respond in the caves uh, that we find ourselves in in life. So the first thing we can do is quite simply just get everything out on the table. Get everything out on the table. What do I mean by that? It's kind of the, it's the title of our series. Be honest with God. He already knows what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're going through. So get it out on the table. Listen here as David gets some things out on the table. He says, I cry aloud to the Lord I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. See, David's getting it out on the table. He's saying, God, this sucks. This wasn't part of the plan. When, when Samuel dumped the oil on my head, this cave was not in the plan. My father-in-law trying to kill me multiple times, even now hunting me like a wild animal. That was not part of the plan. That's not what I signed up for. Have you ever had that moment when you said, that's not what I signed up for? Haven't we all? We have those moments in life when we realize, this isn't what I signed up for. Yes, but it's what God has for you. And God's working, even in the stuff that we didn't sign up for, God's working. And so we'll do ourselves a favor if we just get it all on the table. The modern psalmist says this in a song titled, Crazy. Sick and tired of life's complications, pressures are more than I can bear. Where can I run 
Where can I hide? How do I get out of here? Searching for answers, living day by day, where are the answers to the problems of today? Crazy. It's driving me crazy. Crazy. It's driving me crazy. That was the first song I ever wrote. I thought about playing it, and then I thought, I don't want to embarrass myself that bad. <clears throat> and Mike was probably there when we first performed it at Lake Area. Or, or your basement. That's right. <laughs> that song was written in one of my caves. The cave was my bedroom. It was my place of retreat while I was trying to figure out how to deal with life as it was shifting and changing. I was a teenager. I lost my mom when I was 10. My dad had recently remarried, and I was struggling to figure out how to live in a blended family and how I felt about it. The pinnacle of the song has this line. It says, where have all my priorities gone? My room's a mess, and I don't care. Can I get a witness? <laughs> <clears throat> That was my favorite line from the song. It didn't make it on the screen. Sometimes life just seems so crazy that you just don't even care in the moment. And it's good to get those feelings out, to express them, to realize that they're even there. Sometimes we just don't even realize it's there until we begin to express it. That was the height of my rebellion, by the way. My room's a mess and I don't care. <clears throat> The song concludes with this simple line, Jesus is the answer for the problems of today. Crazy, I'm not crazy. Very profound song written by a young man dealing with life. We gotta get everything out on the table. Psalm 143, David says this, the enemy pursues me, he crushes me to the ground, he makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead, so my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. He's in the cave. This one's not titled that he's in the cave, but he's feeling it, whether he's there literally or not. How about this? Anybody ever felt this one from Psalm 13? How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? Can you identify with that? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart how long will my enemy triumph over me? It's important when you find yourself in the cave to get everything out on the table. Now, let me just say one thing that I don't know if this is scriptural or not, but there's a right place to get everything on the table, and there's a wrong place to get everything on the table. Social media probably isn't the best place to get everything on the table. Can I just say that as your pastor who loves you? The internet probably isn't your best place to get everything out on the table. Maybe a journal. You can type it into your phone. Get it out somewhere, but you don't have to put it out for the entire world to see, at least until maybe you've processed it a little bit and invited God to move in the situation a little bit. It, it's just my thoughts. A good friend, a parent, lots of good places to get it out on the table. Okay, what do we do next? Responding from the cave. Look for your help. We got it out on the table now. Let's look for our help. Let's look for our help. Because there is help. You know, the Beatles wrote a famous song, Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. I knew you guys knew that song. Won't you please help me? Help me. I went back and watched some YouTube videos of the Beatles. I'm like, how were they ever cool? <laughs> I think our society, it's just, they were a product of their times. They were cool in the day. Therefore, they're still cool now, I guess. But their hair, man. Okay, moving on. We got to look for our help. Listen, in Psalm 142, as David's in the cave, He's having this realization. He says, look and see, there's no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I'm all alone. The people that I normally would rely on, they're not here. I have no refuge. 
No one cares for my life. I think he's exaggerating a little bit. I believe there were people in that time that cared about him. But when you're in the cave, you don't see those people. You don't feel those people. But he says, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And here, he's realizing, I feel alone. I feel like the entire world is against me. Where am I going to go for help? And he begins to recognize that there is an obvious direction that he needs to look. And he begins to cry out to the Lord. In Psalm 121, it echoes these words. It says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. See, when you're in the cave, you've got to start looking for your help. And, and quite often, our problem is we're looking for help in all the wrong places. Hey, Siri, I need some help. You know what happens when I try to get help from Siri? I just get mad. I, it's somehow, because it's a human voice, it tricks me into thinking that Siri actually cares about me and knows something. And I start berating my phone thinking that she really cares. And I'm like, Siri, you don't know anything. I'm sorry, I don't know anything. <laughs> We're looking for help in all the wrong places. Google, help me. YouTube, help me. By the way, those things can be extremely helpful in certain situations. I built our house using YouTube. But sometimes Google and YouTube isn't going to cut it. And the next government program isn't necessarily what we need either. There's a deeper need and a better solution that we need. Sometimes we just think technology is the answer to everything in our lives, but it's not necessarily true. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? You almost get the impression, uh, the psalmist here in 121, that, that they're in a battle and they're waiting for the reinforcements to come. They're, it's like they're hunkered in at helms deep and they're in a desperate situation and they're waiting for Gandalf to come riding over the ridge on a white horse with all the reinforcements to deliver them. But the psalmist realizes, I need better help than that even. I need the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The one who created everything that I see. The one whom the heavens declare his glory. That's where my help comes from. My God can do anything. God can speak a word and change anything. That's where my help comes from. And maybe this morning that's just the place where you need to start. Is turning and realizing, God, you can turn anything and work it for good for those who look to you. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 70 here, look for your help. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. And sometimes we forget that we're poor and needy, that we're desperate, and we need God. We, ha we have a desperate need for God in our lives. We, we forget that we're weak. We forget that we're imperfect. We forget that we have issues and that we need desperately God's grace and his mercy today and tomorrow. We need help, and God is our help. That's actually a word that he personifies himself with. He is our help, our ever-present help in time of need. The Holy Spirit, whom Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit Jesus described the Holy Spirit as being the paraclete, the Greek word for your helper, your advocate, the one who comes alongside. And in this day and time, when we have the most intimate access to God in, in the, all of history beyond the Garden of Eden, we have incredible access to God. He offers us the Holy Spirit to be our help, to come alongside us and to walk with us. God is available, and he is our help. But we need to look to him, look to him, instead of looking to ourselves and technology and all these other things that can be helpful, but they are not our help. Responding from the cave, number three, <clears throat> we need to trust. Trust your help. And I think it's safe to say that most of us have trust issues. 
And this next slide it's, explains why turkey bacon is the main reason I have trust issues. Why would they do that? Why would they do that to bacon? If they'll do that to bacon, what else are they doing? <laughs> Turkey bacon is just the least of our issues. But isn't it true we have trust issues? I think it's true. I think all of us are dealing with trust issues in one way or another. Uh, we struggle to trust one another. And sometimes we struggle to trust God. We struggle to trust our help. Psalm 142, David says, I cry to you, Lord, I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. I love how David calls God his refuge. Here, David is in a cave, which isn't a very warm setting when I think about being in a cave. It feels cold, it feels damp, it feels like it smells funny. There's probably bats and critters and snakes, who knows, guano. Isn't that something you find in caves? Maybe in the Philippines, I don't know. I don't think of a cave as being a very homey place. And yet here in the cave, David identifies and he places himself somewhere different. He places himself in God who is his refuge, a safe place. And that's exactly what David needed to feel in that moment while his life was in danger, while he was being hunted. He needed to know I have a safe place, and my safe place is in God, and he's, he's reminding himself of who God is. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves of who God is to activate that trust in our lives. We've got to activate trust. It's not automatically there, but when we take time to think about God, to look at him, to gaze on who he is, to, to examine the nature of God as it's revealed to us through the history of the world... When we examine God, we see, I can trust God. Even just this last week, I was uh, having a, an anxiety bout. I'm not proud of it, and I'm sure a half of you probably had one this week as well. Just a little battle with anxiety, and I was just feeling pretty discouraged about something. And I thought, you know, I need to just make a list. And so I just sat down, and I thought... I just want to make a list of where God has been faithful in this situation. And I just started writing. And before I knew it, I had a whole page. A whole page of ways that God has been faithful in that exact area that I've struggled in, that I was struggling in. And I thought, you know what? This is stupid. Why do I feel anxious about this? God has proven over and over and over again that he is my refuge, that he is my safe place, that he is my help, and I can look to him and I can trust Psalm 28 says this, Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts him, and he helps me. You can trust your help, the Lord. My family likes to watch this show. It's called Running Wild with Bear Grylls. And Bear Grylls is the master of getting people to trust him. In a relatively short amount of time, he takes these celebrities on adventure hikes, and they're gone two days into the wilderness, and before you know it, they're climbing a rope across, <laughs> you know, that looks stupid, right? Like, who would ever do that? Bear has taught them that they can trust him, that he's going to get them there safely. That's Zach Efron, by the way, climbing across, I don't know what you call that, is that a ravine or a canyon? But let me tell you, if you're waiting to develop trust until you're climbing out on that rope, you're too late, right? See, we've got to daily develop our trust in the Lord. We've got to daily, that, that's why it's so important to spend time with the Lord in a quiet place. Just spend time reflecting on how God has been faithful throughout history and spend time reflecting on how God has been at work in your life. And as you reflect on God, as you gaze on him, and you meditate on his faithfulness, trust rises. And you can call out to God from your cave, and you can trust him, and know that God will take care of you. Psalm 143, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Is your life entrusted in the hands of 
the maker of heaven and earth? Have you entrusted your life in his hands? Number four, responding from the cave, wait patiently. That's an easy one. We'll move on. I love this picture here, dog patience. They're all, they're all waiting in line to use the tree. <laughs> I, would, I would generally say patience isn't a word that describes our culture. We like our fast food, our microwave to heat things up. We, we actually have food that begins with the word instant. Do you realize that? Instant rice, instant oatmeal. It's not just oatmeal, it's instant oatmeal. Why? Because we're impatient. Come on. The internet, oh my gosh. Who is on one megabyte download? Ain't nobody got time for that. We need high speed. Come on. When I go buy a car, I don't want to have to figure out if I'm approved for a loan ahead of time. I want to be uh, approved on the spot so I can walk out of there with the keys in my hand. Patience is a lost art. And I'll be the first to admit that I'm failing. But yet, we're told to wait patiently. Listen to David here. He, he was trying to have some instant God uh, movement in his life too. He says, listen to my cry. I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. David was in a desperate place, and yet when we study the story, we find that he lived in the cave for three to six months. Three to six months of cave dwelling. That's where you learn Patience. And it seems that patience is something that we can learn the easy way or the hard way. But I believe that God teaches us patience. God doesn't always move at our pace. Sometimes it takes time for his process to work in our lives. Sometimes it takes time for things to line up and to align. Three to six months in the cave, David spent years on the run it would be years from this moment before David finally assumed the role of king. David wrote Psalm 27 in this, he says, Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. I love that one because he gives an instruction Wait patiently for the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Yes, no, you heard me right. Wait patiently for the Lord. It's like he was going to move on, and then he realized everybody was still stuck back at that first time he said it. Wait patiently for the Lord. Did you know that it takes bravery and courage to wait patiently for the Lord? It takes bravery and courage to wait patiently for the Lord. How did David know this? Because he waited. He waited in the cave, and he waited, and he waited some more, and God tested his heart. God revealed things. It was like things, you know how it works. Things bubble to the surface, and then you deal with them, and then something else. And God was working in David's heart and in his life while he was waiting in the cave. And David comes to this realization that it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Waiting patiently on the Lord is worth the wait. And you know what? The easy way is to quit, to give up, to exit the cave too early. That's the easy way out. But to be brave and courageous and wait patiently for the Lord, it's worth it. It's worth it. The writer of Hebrews says this, We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end, so that what you hope for may be fully realized. How many people want to fully realize the things that you hope for? I do. What's the point in hoping for it if you don't realize it? We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. There's an interesting mix of ingredients, faith and patience. It takes faith and patience to receive your inheritance in the Lord. 
He says, don't be lazy. Don't quit. Don't give up too soon. That's the easy way out. But be patient. Mix it with faith. Trust in God. And you're going to see some awesome things. All right, last one here. Responding from the cave. Number five, praise before your breakthrough. Praise before your breakthrough. And I think it's important to praise before your breakthrough because our, break, our praise isn't necessarily dependent on the breakthrough, right? It's not necessarily dependent on whether God does something now or not because God is worthy to be praised whether there's a breakthrough or not. If I spend the rest of my life in this cave, God is still worthy of being praised. If nothing changes from here to the end of my life, God is still good. God is still faithful. He still loves me. He's still merciful and compassionate. That does not change based on my circumstances. We praise before the breakthrough. I love this Psalm 142. He says, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. And in the midst of of being in the cave, he's recognizing God's goodness. And in fact, if you look through the Psalms, you'll see time and time again, the psalmist pouring out their heart to God. Boy, things are really tough. My enemy's pursuing me. It's really, really hard. God, I praise you. You're awesome. And there's these interjections of praise throughout the Psalms. Why? Because the psalmist recognized, even in my hard situation, I need to lift my eyes And remember that God is good. I need to lift my eyes and remember the maker of heaven and earth. He still loves me. He's still gracious and compassionate. Uh, Psalm 57 is another psalm that carries that subtitle, When David Was in the Cave. It's another cave psalm. And in this one it reads like this. I'm in the midst of lions. I'm forced to dwell among ravenous beasts. Men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. See what I'm talking about? He's surrounded by ravenous beasts. And then all of a sudden, be exalted, God. Just took a moment to remind himself who was really in control. And who the story that we're involved is really about. See, it's not my story. I'm the supporting cast in God's story. And we get to play a part in this beautiful story of creation. We get to be a part of this. But God's the main figure. And God's the one that we need to remember to lift our eyes to. And to praise him. Praise lifts our eyes up. And when we praise, we can focus on the God of the breakthrough and remember that anything is possible in him. But even if nothing changes, he's still faithful. He's still good. He's still gracious. Psalm 57 continues. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. David wrote that in the cave, not after the cave. It's important to praise God while you're in your cave, not just after. Praise before the breakthrough. So just to review, how do we respond from the cave? One, we get everything out on the table. Just get it out there. Let God know what's going on. Process what you're feeling, thinking. Identify with the Psalms there. And then look for your help. Look for your help. And remember that the Lord is our help. The Lord is our help. And then trust your help. Trust God. It's not easy. It's hard. You need to meditate on him. uh, Spend time with the Lord. And as you do that, you begin to develop trust because you see the faithfulness of God. And then wait patiently. That one's easy. And then praise before your breakthrough. Just in closing here, I want to wrap this up by telling the story of another cave experience. As Jesus and his 12 disciples gathered in the upper room, they shared a meal together. It was the Passover meal. It was the last one Jesus would share with his disciples. Before they ate, 
he washed their feet, and then they shared a meal, and then he had this intimate moment with those gathered with him where they shared the bread and the wine, and Jesus said, when you have this, do it in remembrance of me. And then there's an interesting interlude there, and it says, they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. And there's this transitional moment. They finished this really intimate last supper together. And then they sang a song, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is where uh, the Garden of Gethsemane is, which is where Jesus spent the night praying. That's where Judas brought the band of, of, of people to arrest Jesus and drag him off. That's kind of where it all went down. Before they went there, they sang a hymn together. And it's believed that they sang Psalm 136. And I find it interesting what they sang before concluding their time together. It goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. And it continues on through their time in Israel's time in Egypt to taking possession of the promised land this reminder, his love endures forever. His love endures forever. And then Jesus went and demonstrated on the cross that his love endures forever. And when you find yourself in the cave, remember that they took his body down and they stuck it into a cave that was made into a tomb and it's there that he sealed once and for all that his love endures forever. What a great reminder for us, huh? For God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because his love endures forever. When you're in your cave experience, if you can remember nothing else, remember that his love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Psalms. We thank you uh, that they're written in a way that we can relate with. They, they tap into our emotions. They, ca- they capture our imagination. We don't understand them all, all the time. But God, they, they give us a picture of what it looks like to follow you and that we live in, <clears throat> we live in a broken world. And sometimes we find ourselves in caves. And God, it's important to remember that you don't leave us in the cave because Jesus took our place. Jesus died on the cross and they put his body in that tomb, but he didn't stay there. On the third day, he rose from the grave sealing our victory in you 
And God, I just thank you that it's, it's by your mercy and it's by your grace, but you have a way out of that cave for us. And so, Lord, this morning, I, I pray for this family, for this church, for those who are watching online, for any who find themselves in a cave, Lord, remind us of how you took our place in the cave. And you have a way out. But Lord, we also know that you're working in us. And so we look to you, our help. We trust you. We wait patiently on the work that you want to do in our lives. And God, we just say, here I am. Do what you need to do. Because I know that it's in the cave that you turn men and women into kings and queens. And Lord, we don't want to miss out on that finished work. We don't want to miss out on that. So Lord, give us patience in this season. And give us strength to carry on. If you're here this morning and you just want to pray a personal prayer of surrender to the one who took your place, to Jesus, who came and demonstrated the enduring love of God. If you just want to pray a, 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 a simple prayer of dedication and faith that says, Jesus, thank you. I, I'll just lead you in one. You can just pray it in your heart with me. It just says, Jesus, thank you that you came to demonstrate the enduring love of God. And I thank you that you took my place on the cross and you took my place in the cave so that I can have new life in you. And I trust my life into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you this week. And hopefully, you don't find yourself in too deep of a cave. But if you do, remember to look for your help and to trust him. He will get you through. If you prayed that prayer here, Maybe for the first time, we have these green bags on each side of the stage. Those just have some resources for you and uh, some things that you can use to take your next steps in your relationship with God. Other than that, we want to dismiss. Uh, let me remind you, next Sunday is a really cool Sunday. Uh, we did this last year as well. We're calling it Freedom Sunday, and we're going to hear testimonies uh, from see some people about how God has brought freedom in their lives, and we're really looking forward to that. So come on out next week to support them and to celebrate with them as they share their stories of freedom. So God bless you. Have a good day.